and Sky News Business. This is Business Class. Hi, I'm James Wilkinson and welcome to Business Class. Today's show is coming to you from London, which this week has been playing host to Chogham and the Queen's 92nd birthday. Before we show you a few great things to do in the capital at the moment, here's this week's travel news. In travel news this week, Air New Zealand is facing several more months of cancellations and delays as a result of global issues with the Rolls-Royce engines that power its Boeing 7879 Dreamliner fleet. The airline says it expects around 9,000 customers will be affected by retimed international services this week alone. Air New Zealand says the impact is confined to flights operating to Los Angeles, Houston, Tokyo Haneda and a number of Trans-Tasman and Pacific Island flights. According to the airline, all other services are expected to operate as normal and the number of customers likely to be impacted by these changes is less than 3% of all customers travelling with Air New Zealand this week. Air New Zealand is not the only airline facing cancellations and delays, with the issue affecting some 350 Rolls-Royce Trent 1000 Dreamliner engines across the world. On to British Airways now, and Sky News can exclusively reveal today that the airline's enhanced Club World Business Class offering will be available on Sydney flights from July 1. The new restaurant-style premium dining service includes display trolleys which feature a choice of freshly prepared starters and desserts, all served on new table settings. Breakfast cards will also be handed out, while wines, cocktails and other drinks are now being served in premium glassware. Later this year, a new betting service will also be available in Club World Business Class on flights to Sydney. And Sky News can also reveal today that a brand new all aisle access business class seat is set to be launched globally by British Airways in 2019. Later in today's show, we get the exclusive news in an interview with British Airways' as regional commercial manager for the Southwest Pacific, Nicole Bacco. American Airlines has appointed top Sydney-based chef Sean Connolly to introduce his award-winning cuisine on board the airline's routes down under. The celebrity chef, who has restaurants in Australia and New Zealand, will introduce his knowledge of local cuisine to premium cabins on all American Airlines flights from Sydney and Auckland to the United States this month. Fiji Airways has signed a code share agreement with Singapore Airlines and Silk Air that will provide convenient connections for customers traveling to Fiji from 10 destinations in Asia and Europe through Singapore. Under the agreement, Singapore Airlines and Silk Air customers can access Fiji Airways as non-stop flights between Singapore and Nandi, including the airline's third weekly seasonal service that was launched on April 4, 2018. In hotel news, the brand new Vibe Hotel North Sydney has opened its doors this week. The hotel features 187 guest rooms with a Sydney Harbour inspired design alongside plenty of natural light and street views. The hotel will be a draw card for corporate groups and business travellers, with four flexible meeting rooms offering up to 110 people, alongside free Wi-Fi and top fitness facilities. Hotel guests will also have access to a rooftop pool, while a rooftop bar is set to open later this year. Vibe hotels are currently in a major expansion phase, and new hotels are under construction in Hobart, Melbourne and Sydney. The designer So brand by Aqua Hotels is also expanding, with hotels opening this year in Berlin, St. Petersburg, Vienna and Auckland. So hotels are known for their local energy and a rebellious take on lifestyle luxury, as well as their impressive creative collaborations with preeminent fashion designers. Most famously, the So Singapore was designed in collaboration with Karl Lagerfeld. The new Auckland So is set to become one of the best in the collection, and it will occupy the former New Zealand Reserve Bank building, which name is the lively Britomart Precinct and Waterfront. Due to open in July 2018, the property will feature 133 guest rooms and suites, alongside a concept restaurant and bar that's destined to become one of the best in the Britomart. British Airways has been flying between London and Australia for 83 years. Currently, the airline's undergoing a number of innovations at present, and to find out more, we spoke to British Airways' regional commercial manager for the Southwest Pacific, Nicole Bacco. We're at Sydney Airport. Uh, British Airways has been flying to Australia for 83 years. That's a long time in one market, isn't it? 
It is, it is. We're very proud of our heritage in Australia. As you said, 83 years of flying and we still remain the only European carrier flying to Australia. We have a single plane service operating daily through from Sydney through to Singapore's award-winning Changi Airport and on to our award-winning home, London Heathrow Terminal 5. So when you talk about um, British Airways, Nicole, you've got um, the whole suite of products, first, business, premium and economy all mm -hmm. the way to London. That's right. So yes, it is the four cabin service uh, operating through Singapore Changi Airport onto into Heathrow Terminal 5. And we've got some exciting new announcements. So we announced a £4.5 billion investment into our products and services early this year as part of our five-year business plan. And what that means, so our customers in World Traveller Economy are already experiencing an enhancement to the meals menu service on board. It's an additional um, meal that's served. It's a hot breakfast for our overnight flight. Um, option, more options in terms of snacking and enjoying those throughout the flight and while you're watching the movies. Uh, in July this year, we will be introducing our enhancements to our Club World Business Class catering as well as part of that. Wi-Fi will be put onto both our long haul and short haul fl fleet by the end of next year. We also introduced our first uh, wing in Heathrow where our premium customers and eligible customers can experience a dedicated first class check-in area, go straight through security and straight into the lounge which really streamlines that process for our first class customers and they're really enjoying that. And European summer this year will see us operate more choice of routing options for customers. We'll have 38 new routes operating this summer, uh, which is an increase of 17% from 2016. Ideal for Aussies that want to catch London and another European destination, isn't it? Absolutely. So we already have over 60 destinations anyway, but we find with Australian travellers they will do London and then they will go on to either another UK or European uh, city. So these extra options really create um, much more varied itineraries for our customers from this market. And a lot more new aircraft coming in for you as well around the globe on your network. That's right. So again, as part of that £4.5 billion investment, there's 72 new aircraft coming into the fleet. Uh, and along with that also another over 100 aircraft are being refitted as well with all of our new products and services. We'll also see next year the introduction of a new Club World seat, a new business class seat, which will have direct dial access for every customer. And what are the most popular cabins out of here? We, every time you and I talk, it seems like premium is constantly full the whole time. It is. Premium is really uh, important out of this market. It does really well. I guess that's due to the, the length of journey. Uh, our premium economy cabin has always been a success in this market as well. Now it's time for Nisha Wild and Foodie Files, this week with a British flavour. Thanks James, yes it's certainly all happening in London at the moment. Starting with Annabelle's, one of the world's most famous nightclubs, in one of the world's wealthiest neighbourhoods, Mayfair. Now, Annabelle's opened back in 1963 as a decadent private club and it's just reopened after a lavish redesign. So, what do you get for £55 million? Well, you get four restaurants and no less than seven bars spread across four levels. You get serious art, a few Murano chandeliers here and there, a space they're calling the garden with retractable glass roof. Even the loos are completely over the top. The ladies' powder room has been described as a heavenly riot of pink marble. Oh, and my favourite piece, a life-size sculpture of Pegasus dangling from a hot air balloon in one of the hallways. Fabulous. The other big news in Mayfair is the launch of the hottest restaurant of the year in London, very anticipated. That's Hyde from venerated chef Ollie Debu. Hyde is spread over three levels. There's a bar in the basement, an all-day restaurant and bakery on the ground floor and fine dining upstairs. Hyde also boasts one of the largest wine collections in the world and it overlooks Green Park. So that's Hyde, a good one to seek out. So, back in Oz, if you're not busily planning your trip to London for the Royal Wedding, you can always cheer yourself up with a glass of English sparkling wine. British wine writers have been tracking the rise in quality English fizz for the past decade now, and it's finally starting to gain traction here. Look out for a label called Hattingley Valley from Hampshire. It's excellent, and you'll find it on the wine list at Dinner by Heston in Melbourne and Aria in Sydney. Also in Sydney, a couple of other go-tos with English fizz on the list. One is Restaurant Nell from Lancashire-born chef Nellie Robinson. He does a rather posh ploughman's lunch, incidentally, which is also available at dinner. 
and the other is the Duke of Clarence Hotel in the city, which opened late last year. Now, the first thing you need to know about the Duke of Clarence is that it is not one of those tacky-themed English pubs. It has a Liverpoolian owner and a Nottingham-born chef, and they've done it all very authentically. So you really do feel like you're walking into a 19th century London tavern. Plus, there's a fair bit of nostalgia on the smart menu as well. In fact, it looks like pub food is trending at the moment. I'm looking forward to trying the new menu at the historic Terminus Hotel in Piermont, currently being overhauled by everyone's favourite Irish chef, Colin Fasnage. He's already got a hit on his hands at the suburban Banksia Hotel with classic pub dishes like house-made pies, bangers and mash and ham hock with Col Cannon. But really, Colin, you had me at suckling pig sausage roll. So that's it from me. Stay tuned for a trip to the Beaumont Hotel in London, also in Mayfair, with James Wilkinson and Jeremy King right after this break. You're watching Business Class on Sky News Business. Welcome back to Business Class. Back here in England, London offers some of the world's most beautiful, luxurious and boutique hotels. London is home to some top-notch boutique and luxury hotels found in modern skyscrapers, classic buildings and quaint townhouses. For a real London townhouse experience, stay at number 16 in South Kensington, which features 41 rooms alongside a courtyard restaurant called The Orangery that's one of the most picturesque in the city. I always feel that if you're staying at number 16 in South Kensington, you feel like a Londoner in London because number 16 is a series of stucco buildings. They're pure white and just around the corner from the museums and Kensington Gardens. And then once you're in the hotel, we have a series of rooms and we felt it would be lovely to have summer in one room and winter in another room. But equally, you could look at it as day and night. Having this little succession of rooms with very different feels makes it more of an adventure. Then we walk through to the Orangery and this room is light filled, filled with art of course and lots of flowers and it leads on to our little gem of a garden at the back. It's such a hidden treasure. There's a length of view as you look from the Orangery right to the gazebo at the end of the garden and that encapsulates a beautiful fish pond which is planted with iris and water lilies. There's a sculpture and many fish that children just love to lie down and look at very closely. To create a successful garden, it's good to have architectural and sculptural features. For our sculpture, we have a wonderful slate circle by Tom Stogden and that sits against a curtain of laurel and stands out quite beautifully. We also have mosaics which are beneath the wooden arch and they almost work like carpets within a garden. So we have the York stone and the pebbles, the mosaics and the slate. So all these different textures work together to make the garden very special. It's so wonderful to see so much nature right in the centre of South Kensington. The garden is a real sanctuary that works at any time of day. We wanted this room to reflect the garden. There should be a vividness and light about it. So the colors actually work very well and the two work together. The artworks are pieces that we've collected over the years and three of them are actually Aboriginal. We have a spiky hedgehog, wonderful mythical cats, and we have one elephant that appears to be half elephant and half zebra. And presiding over the whole scene are Thelma and Louise. They're completely made out of papier-mâché. Number 16 is part of our townhouse collection. The bedrooms are light, airy and colourful, most of all comfortable. Every time you come and stay, it can be a different experience. At the front of the building, you're overlooking a tree-lined street, and at the back, the beautiful gardens of number 16 at Sumner Place. So staying here makes you feel as if you're a Londoner. You're part of that village feel of South Kensington, and it's a place to make your own. One of the most storied hotels here is the Beaumont. We sat down with London restaurant legend Jeremy King to find out more.
from a design standpoint, have you always wanted to do an Art Deco themed hotel? No, I love the Art Deco period, but whether it's restaurants or hotels, I always react to the building. The building tells me the story. Um, this had a story. It was built as a car park. Um, I had to brief all my uh, architect, interior designer, etc., on a Monday morning as to what the hotel was going to be, and I didn't know. I knew how I sort of lay it out, etc. 4 a.m. I said, God, it's so much easier if there's an existing history. So I invented the history, and hence, because it was a 26 building, um, not a lot happened in the UK of interest, but in, in America there was prohibition. So the story of Jimmy Beaumont, a refugee, so to speak, from prohibition and everything that that entailed, opening up a small American-inspired hotel, and this is like a love letter to America in many ways, but not a museum of the 20s. Um, it's, a, it's a hotel which if an American had owned and it, it had evolved. Of course, the truth of the matter, it was a car park. Um, truth, truth of the matter, we demolished the whole thing behind a facade, but we pretended that we'd discovered it at the end of its life and refurbished it. As the Art Deco just suited the building, the, the building dictated it. So most fictional characters are in, are in books. And uh, this fictional character ends up becoming a hotel. He, it does, and the thing about it is that people believe the story. And I've, told, I've embellished these stories. I talk about the fact that Scott Fitzgerald and Ernest Hemingway stayed here in the war, and people believe it. And I even have people <coughs> who tell me their parents stayed here but, <coughs> and after the war and so on. I'm in a dilemma. I don't know whether to tell them, actually, it was a car park, so they'd be <laughs> sleeping in their car if that was the case. Uh, it, there's not much of a story out of a car park, I think, is there but for people, a building. I, I think people love storytelling, and I think people love belonging. I, I think when I walk into a hotel, I want to be Mr. King um, uh, immediately. I want somebody to just show that they care about me. But the ultimate thing is whether it's a restaurant or a hotel, if you build something and operate it as the place you would like to go and stay, then you have a chance of making it work. And you're getting, you're getting a lot of repeat guests. Obviously, some of their parents didn't stay here, but no. uh, you are getting a lot of repeat guests here. Aren't Extraordinary you? number. Um, we, we, we're primarily American and British, which is very gratifying, but it's great that we're now spreading our wings and Australia is coming in, into, into play, South America. We've got a very good demographic, um, but I've got people who've stayed 60, 70, 80 times, and we've only been open three and a half years. And you're in a very um, a busy part of London, Mayfair, obviously well known for its luxury hotels as well. Mm. But you're a bit of a hidden gem here in Mayfair, aren't you? Well, I always think that's a, that, that's a weakness at first and then a strength. And it might be the same with the restaurant. It's tucked away. But then I, people like discovery. Certain countries, people like to be told what to do. Uh, the British way is actually to almost foster a secret. And it's, and it's turned into a, a great secret that's spread around a bit, obviously. And how do you then maintain that clientele to get them coming back 70, 80, 80 uh, nights? Mainly through not being greedy. Um, there's always a discussion with the investors, but uh, Yanis has embraced my idea is that you don't do dynamic pricing. There's nothing more irritating than going to your hotel in January and for instance, being quoted £300 for your room, and then when you ask to come back to the same room in May, that it's 900 and if you want to come back in June, it's 1500 You'd never do it in a restaurant. You wouldn't tell people what the price of steak was, depending on the night of the week that you go to it. And that's what happens in hotels, which means you don't foster loyalty because people buy on price in the same way with an airline. It's, it becomes very difficult to trust uh, and, and always fly with an airline if the, if the price varies. So we try and we have high season, mid season, low season, but you kind of know what you're going to pay and that affords people. We, we have a lot who will come six, eight, ten times a year uh, already. So that, that's the foundation. And you do a few more things here in the hotel uh, where you do give away things to guests, yeah. obviously. You've got free movies in the rooms and a yeah. big movie library at that. You've got some amazing chocolates at Turndown. <laughs> Uh, do, uh, those little things always help, don't they? I think so. I mean, uh, one of the, the things I've been preaching, uh, both in restaurants and hotels, generosity. We all want to feel that we don't have to pay for every Coke. I remember there was a, a manager of a band who was staying here, and he said, Are you Mr. King? I said, yes, I want to talk to you. I thought, oh, God, what's gone wrong? And he said, 
minibar, no charge, unless it's alcohol. Brilliant. He said, I've been here a week. I've had two Cokes. I must have told 30 people. He said, nobody does that. It's not, and if you give things away, I'd like to give even more away. People, people are surprised, and um, that has been a big strength. Now we're down here in the Colony Grill, and um, a great, really great brasserie-style food here in the middle of London, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, the con it was actually the grill room phenomenon came around because people were trying to relax um, eating, because normally, at the beginning of the 20th century, you'd have to dress for dinner. And the American traveler, who was much more intrepid than, than most, was saying, I, I, you know, I want to have decent food, but I don't want it formal, nor do I want five or six courses. So the, the grill room started, and it's a very transatlantic matter. And so you find on the menu here things which uh, are very much of that, of that period. The nice thing about it, of course, there's a big revolution in food but I'm a great believer that you mustn't try and jump on bandwagons. There is a lot of people who want to eat very classic, traditional food as long as the ingredients are good and cooked properly. Because uh, if, you, if you run after that bandwagon, I think it was A.A. Gill, the critic, said, be careful, because if you're not sure of your footing, you might fall flat on your face. So we're very classic here. But also because I think when you're, if you're a traveler, you come in and into town, and often all you want is a piece of grilled fish and a glass of wine and go to bed. You don't want a five-course formal dinner. But restaurants and hotels is always the great conundrum, how the hell to do it. So I'm not surprised then guests come here thinking their parents had stayed here. Uh, absolutely. It's, uh, and and you know, we came down in the lift and you see all the, all the photographs of people arriving in hotels, getting off boats. That was a glorious period uh, of travel, of course, the 20s and 30s. And Jimmy Beaumont had quite a few stories, obviously, didn't he? He had quite a few stories. I'm not, and, and it got, it got um, last year even more interesting when Savile Row did, nine of the Savile Row tailors all created a wardrobe for Jimmy Beaumont, uh, did what they imagined he would have worn casually, formally, and so on, and it started to travel around. So where fact and fiction end, I don't know now, but it's, um, it, it, for me, it's, it gives the important ingredients in any hotel or restaurant. And when people ask, they say, you know, what, what, what will make them great? Is it the location? Is it the design? Is it the chef? Is it what? And I always say two things, heart and soul. And heart and soul are difficult to define and, and difficult to find. Well, that's it from us in London. Thanks for watching and see you next time in Rome. You're watching Business Class on Sky News Business.